Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 19 of Advanced Linear Algebra. In this class, we're going to talk about the norm induced by the inner product. The idea here is, think back to introductory linear algebra. We would often talk about the length of a vector, just in the usual Euclidean sense. How far is it from the tail of the vector up to the head of the vector? Well, we showed in that class that the way to calculate this is you take the vector and you dot it with itself. You do v dot v, and then you square root the answer that you get. Well, because the generalization of the dot product is, well, inner products, it makes sense to do something similar in arbitrary vector spaces. And the idea here is we're going to get a way of measuring sort of how long or how big vectors in arbitrary vector spaces are. Okay, so here's the setup. Suppose that you've got V, which is an inner product space. All I mean here by inner product space is it's a vector space with a particular inner product. Okay, so I have a particular inner product in mind on this vector space. Then we say that the norm induced by the inner product is, well, it's a function that spits out a positive real number. It, it's a function from the inner product space to the set of real numbers defined in this way. It's just the function that you get if you do the inner product of the vector with itself and then square root at the end of the day. Okay, and again, the idea here is that this function, it sort of measures how large a vector is. Okay, so let's go through a couple quick examples here to try to get a bit of intuition for how these norms induced by inner products work. Okay, so starting off, let's look at the standard inner product on CN. In other words, the dot product on CN. Okay, what is the norm induced by the inner product in that case, if that's the vector space and that's the inner product that we're working with? Okay, well, just by definition, it's square root of inner product of V with V, and then you plug in, well, what is that inner product? Well, it's just the dot product. So it's the sum of all the VI bars, VI, right? And then square root at the end of the day. But then VI bar times VI, well, whenever you have a number times its own complex conjugate, it just equals the length or magnitude of that complex number squared. Okay, so the norm induced by the inner product on this space, on CN, it's just the two norm, right? It's just the usual Euclidean norm. You take the length or magnitude of each entry in your vector, square it, add those up, and then square root at the end of the day. Okay, just like the usual vector length that we're used to on Rn. Okay, so what if we go to slightly more exotic vector spaces? Okay, what about the space CAB, so remember this is the space of continuous functions on the real interval from A to B, okay? And the usual inner product on this space, the standard inner product, it's just the integral from A to B of f of x times g of x, right? That's the inner product of f and g. Okay, so what is the norm induced by this standard inner product on this vector space? Well, again, all you do is you do the inner product of the function with itself and then square root at the end of the day. Okay, and what you get, I mean, usually it's f of x times g of x. Well, here it's just g equals f. So you just get f of x times itself. In other words, f of x all squared. All right, so what is this? This is the integral of f of x all squared and then square root at the end of the day. Okay, that's the norm induced by the inner product. And again, the way to think of this is this is sort of measuring how big your function is. Okay, you can think of the sort of the squaring as negating the fact that the function might go below the x-axis. So you don't have things canceling out when you integrate anymore. This really is sort of measuring how far f is away from zero on the entirety of the interval from a to b. Okay, how about the, the matrix space, M, M, N, okay? What our standard inner product on that space is the Frobenius inner product. Remember, it's trace of A star B, okay? Well, again, you just plug the same matrix into both slots of that inner product and then square root at the end of the day. So you do inner product of A with A and then square root. And so it's square root of trace of A star A. And if you just sort of work through that definition and write things out in terms of the entries of the matrix A, it makes it a little bit more clear really why this is measuring the size of the matrix A. All you're doing is you're adding up the magnitude squared of every single entry in that matrix. Okay, right, we got a double sum for the sort of the two directions you can sum over in the matrix, and then you're just adding up and squaring every entry in the matrix entry-wise. Okay, and then of course square root at the end of the day. So we call this, I mean, this is the norm induced by the Frobenius inner product on this matrix space, and we call it the Frobenius norm, 
As we go throughout this course, we're actually gonna see a whole bunch of different matrix norms. So we're gonna be really careful uh, when we talk about different matrix norms. This one, we're gonna use a subscript F just to clarify this is the particular function we mean. We'll see a couple other matrix norms later on and we'll use different notation for them. So that's the only reason I'm using a subscript F there is just to avoid ambiguity later on in the course. All right, so those are some norms induced by inner products. And sort of to justify the fact that we think about them as measuring how big something is, we should show that they satisfy properties that the length of a vector satisfies in Rn. We should so show that they sort of behave like a length function should behave. Okay, and that's sort of what our next few theorems are doing. All right, so our first one pins down the easy properties that norms induced by inner products satisfy. Okay, so this theorem says standard setup for this situation. Suppose you've got some inner product space, so you've got an inner product to work with and you can talk about a norm induced by an inner product. And suppose you've got some vector in there and some scalar. Then these properties hold. The first one is just, if you multiply a vector by a scalar, well, how much did the length of that vector increase? Well, it increased by a factor of whatever you just multiplied it by. If you multiply a vector by seven, then you increase its length by a factor of seven. If you multiply a vector by minus three, you increase its length by a factor of three, absolute value of C, right? Okay, and that's very straightforward to prove. You just use properties A and B of the definition of an inner product, okay? So both of these properties, they just come almost immediately from the defining properties of an inner product up above. So we're not actually gonna write down a proof for this theorem. Part B down here says that the length of a vector is always bigger than or equal to zero. Well, good, it's a length, we should hope so, okay? And furthermore, equality holds if and only if it's the zero vector. In other words, every non-zero vector has strictly positive length. And again, hopefully that makes some sort of intuitive sense. We would want a length function to do that. Okay, and this follows actually immediately from the third defining property of inner products. Okay, there's nothing even to prove here. This is one of the defining properties of inner products. So just go back up a couple pages and check that. Okay, so those are sort of the obvious and easy properties of vector lengths. Uh, sorry, norms induced by inner products, but there's also a couple of very, very not obvious properties. Okay, and we saw these properties for the length of a vector in R hand back in the previous course but let's pin them down in arbitrary vector spaces now, okay? And the first one is the Cauchy-Swartz inequality, okay? So again, you've seen this already in Rn, but now we're gonna show it for arbitrary inner product spaces, okay? So here's the setup. Suppose you've got an inner product space, so you have an inner product to work with, we can talk about norm induced by an inner product. Um, and then suppose you got some vectors in that vector space. Then what happens is the absolute value of the inner product of those two vectors, it's never bigger than the product of their two norms, okay? Where these norms are the norms induced by the inner product. Okay? And furthermore, there's an equality condition. The only way that you ever get equality here is if V and W forms a, a linearly dependent set. In other words, if they're multiples of each other or one of them's the zero vector. Okay, so you can think of this as sort of the best relationship that you can come up with between the inner product of two vectors and their lengths, okay? Every possible sort of relationship between those quantities is characterized by this inequality here, okay? In, in other words, if I give you a particular inner product and a pair of vector lengths and ask you, hey, can you come up with vectors that have this inner product and these lengths? All you have to do is you check whether or not Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is satisfied, that tells you. If Corsi Schwartz inequality is satisfied by those quantities, then yes, you can find vectors that do that, that have those quantities. Otherwise you can't. Okay, so here's how it works. Here, we're, we're gonna prove this theorem. And the way that it works is, well, basically it comes from non-negativity of the norm induced by an inner product. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at some linear combination of V and W, okay? So I don't know what linear combination I want yet, but some linear combination, CV, plus dw, I'm gonna take the length of that and square it just to get rid of the square roots everywhere to make the work a little bit cleaner to go through. All right, so because this is the length of a vector, uh, sorry, norm induced by an inner product of a vector and then squared, hey, I certainly know that that's bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, but the nice thing is even though uh, norms induced by inner products are kind of ugly and hard to work with. If you transform it back into inner products, then you think have things like linearity in the second component and stuff like that, which makes it easier to work with. So let's convert this expression here into an expression involving an inner product, right? Remember, inner product of a vector with itself uh, is just the square of the norm induced by an inner product. 
Okay, so we're sort of undoing the definition of norm induced by an inner product here. And now we've got inner product of something with something. All I'm going to do is I'm going to split that apart using linearity in the second entry and conjugate linearity in the first entry. So when I do that, like you're just going to, it's sort of like doing FOIL with your usual arithmetic on real numbers, right? If you have a, a binomial times a binomial, you just get four products at the end of the day when you expand it out. Similar thing here, I'm going to get CV inner product with CV. And then when you pull scalars out, I'm going to get a complex conjugate of C and then no C, uh, no complex conjugate of C. So I get that and the V with V. Similarly, I'm gonna get a CV inner product with DW and that gives me this term and so on. You get four terms at the end of the day. This first term simplifies, hey, this complex conjugate of C times C, that's the magnitude or length of C squared. Inner product of V with V, well, that's the, inner, that's the norm induced by the inner product squared. Okay, similarly with the last term, that guy turns into this once you use these nice properties of complex numbers and norm induced by the inner product. These two cross terms maybe look a little bit weird if you're not so comfortable with complex numbers, but what's happening here is the second cross term is the complex conjugate of the first cross term, right? Remember, con uh, for inner products, you have conjugate symmetry. So WV is the complex conjugate of VW, and similarly, this guy here is the complex conjugate of that one there. All right, so I'm taking a number and I'm adding its complex conjugate to it. Well, that just gives me double the real part of that complex number. And that's just a general fact about complex numbers. Okay, if you take a complex number and add its conjugate to it, you just get double the real part. And the reason for that is just shown right here. If you do A plus IB plus A minus IB, in other words, plus the complex conjugate, well, the imaginary parts cancel out and you're just left with 2A, double the real part. So that's all I did here. These two cross terms turn into this double the real part. Okay, so that's sort of step one of the proof. And now step two of the proof is picking a particular choice of C and D that gives us a good inequality here. This inequality that I've circled, that's true no matter which C and D you choose, no matter what numbers you plug in there. Okay, this quantity here is always bigger than or equal to zero. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a particularly clever choice for C and D that gets us the inequality we want. I'm gonna choose C to be the length of W. I'm gonna choose D to be this ugly number here. I'm just gonna plug those into this quantity here and get something bigger than or equal to zero. So how's it work? Okay, so if I plug C equals length of W in here, well now I've got length of W squared, length of V squared. And similarly, just plug C and D into these two terms here and you get this junk here. Okay, and from here on, it's just simplify, 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 simplify. W inner product V times V inner product W. Again, those are complex conjugates of each other. And whenever you have complex number times its complex conjugate, you get the length or magnitude of that number squared. Okay, and then real part doesn't actually even do anything to it. The real part of this number is that number. Okay, and then, well, this guy's still over here, and then you can combine these two terms, and you end up with ex this expression over here on the bottom, which, after you bring this, in uh, this inner product term over to the left-hand side and then square root everything, that's exactly the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, right? You just rearrange this inequality to get exactly the inequality that we actually want up at the top there. You can get the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality just by rearranging them. Okay, and that's all there is to it. Okay, so the nice thing about this uh, about this inequality, and sort of more generally, the nice thing about vector spaces and inner product spaces is they help you prove things um, sort of by only focusing on the important structure while ignoring the structure that's not relevant to you. For example, if I'm working in this the vector space of matrices, and I work with my standard inner product, the Frobenius inner product then what this inequality tells me is that, well, the absolute value of sorry, the absolute value squared of trace of A star B is always less than or equal to the trace of A star A times the trace of B star B, right? That's just plugging stuff into this inequality here. It's sort of specializing that inequality to the vector space of matrices with the standard for being a center product. And if you tried to prove that inequality directly, right? Like if I gave you an assignment question that said, hey, prove this inequality here, it would be very, very difficult. But sort of if you forget about the fact that you're working with matrices and just work abstractly with inner product spaces, then somehow it becomes easier. It becomes a little bit more straightforward to think about it using just the structure that's actually relevant. The fact that they're matrices doesn't really matter here. Similarly, if I apply this inequality on the vector space CAB, continuous functions from A to B, I get this inequality here. I get this weird integral inequality that again would be very hard to prove sort of directly if I asked you to 
But when you think about things abstractly as vector spaces, it becomes a little bit simpler because you're only focusing on the structure that really matters. Okay, so that's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. That's the first tricky property of the norm induced by an inner product. Okay. The second tricky property is the triangle inequality. And again, this should be very intuitive if you're thinking about these norms induced by inner products as lengths. Um, but actually pinning it down requires a bit of work. And in particular, it's going to rely on the fact that we know of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality now. So here's the setup. Suppose you've got some vector space V with an inner product on it, and you got some vectors in that inner product space. Then the, the norm induced by the inner product of the sum of those two vectors, it's never any bigger than the sum of the norms induced by the inner products. And again, if you think of these as lengths, this makes sense. The reason it's called the triangle inequality is it's just saying, well, this length, like one of the lengths of the sides of a triangle can never be bigger than the sum of the other two lengths, right? Okay, in, in, in other words, if you want to go from point A to point B, the shortest way to go there is just in a straight line, go there. You can't sort of get there faster by going somewhere else first and then going where you want to go. All right, so again, if we think of these as lengths, it makes sense. How do we prove it though? Pinning it down mathematically is, is kind of tricky. All right, so same sort of setup as the previous proof though. The way that it goes is let's work with the length, or sorry, the, the norm induced by the inner product squared instead, just so that we don't have square roots going throughout our entire proof, and then we can square root at the end of the day. All right, well, norm induced by the inner product squared is just vector inner product vector. Okay, and then we expand out, just like we did in the proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We get four terms, all right? And then again, we combine the two cross terms, just like we did in the proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. These guys are complex conjugates of each other, so we get double the real part when we add them up, okay? And these two terms on the outside are just norms induced by inner product squared. All right, and now we're gonna do something kind of tricky that we haven't quite done before. Double the real part of something is always less than or equal to double the length or magnitude of that thing, okay? So any complex number, any complex number, if you take the real part of it, it's never bigger than the length or magnitude of that complex number. And the reason for that is just, I mean, the real part of a complex number, it's just like the a part, right? If z equals a plus ib, then the real part is just a. Whereas the length or magnitude is square root of a squared plus b squared, and this number over here is always bigger than a. Geometrically, it's, I mean, the length or magnitude, this makes sense. The length or magnitude is specifying how far away from the origin or zero it is. Well, it's always at least as far away as a is, as the, the real part is, right? Because, I mean, it might be real, in which case those two numbers co coincide, but it's also got an up or down, an imaginary component as well. All right, so that's where the first inequality comes from. And then the second one, the second one is, well now, hey, I see, hey, I've got uh, an inner product here, and I know that inner product is always less than or equal to the product of the lengths, product of the norms. That's just the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. That's what we just proved on the previous page. All right, so this first inequality is because the real part's less than or equal to the length or magnitude. The second inequality is just exactly the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And now once we've gotten this far, now it's in a form where it's just, you know, a product and sum of a bunch of real numbers. I can just factor that now. Okay, this is just the norm of V plus the norm of W, all squared. And now I just stick a square root over absolutely everything. And I get what I want. I get this norm is less than or equal to this norm plus this norm, which is exactly the triangle inequality. So from there, I'm done. Alrighty, so that does it for lecture 19. We know all about norms induced by inner products now. Next class, we're going to go on to something called orthogonality. So I will see you then.